Good afternoon and welcome to McGuire Woods' SEC Compliance and Disclosure Update. I'm Jill Webb, Senior Counsel in the firm's Securities and Capital Markets Department, and I'll be the moderator for today's forum. McGuire Woods is a full-service law firm with more than 1,100 attorneys in 22 worldwide offices. Our more than 50 securities and capital markets lawyers represent some of the nation's largest business and, fin business and financial institutions. We regularly serve as counsel in public and private securities offerings, and we help clients understand and address unique securities compliance issues and reporting requirements. Recently named Banking and Finance Law Firm of the Year by Law360, McGuire Woods regularly ranks among the top leading law firms in capital markets league tables. Before we begin today's program, I would like to call your attention to the Q&A icon in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. Please use this widget to submit questions you may have for our panelists at any time during the program. We will do our best to address your questions in the time allotted, but if we are unable to do so, we will follow up with you by email. You'll find a number of additional resources along the bottom of your screen, which we encourage you to explore during the presentation. Notably, the, quote, meeting materials folder, unquote, includes a copy of today's presentation slides. Without further ado, allow me to introduce our first speaker, Daniel Bidwell. Daniel is based in our Richmond office, and he concentrates his practice on securities and other corporate transactional matters. He will be discussing the recent changes to Regulation SK. Daniel? Thanks so much, and uh, thanks everyone for listening in today. As Jill said, my name is Daniel Bidwell, and I'm going to be discussing recent changes that the SEC made to Regulation SK. As I hope you will all recognize through this presentation, the changes that the SEC recently adopted, while somewhat incremental, reflect the staff's commitment to modernizing and simplifying disclosures in periodic reports, registration statements, and prospectuses. The background to these changes starts in December 2015 when President Obama signed the Fixing America's Surface Transportation, or FAST Act. The FAST Act is primarily an act for long-term funding of transit and highway projects, but included two requirements impacting the SEC staff and the securities laws. First, the staff was directed to prepare a report on how to simplify and modernize disclosure requirements in various security filings. This report was ultimately submitted by the staff in November of 2016. Next, the SEC was directed to eliminate duplicative, overlapping, outdated, or unnecessary provisions of Regulation SK. In October 2017, the staff published a proposed release for various changes to Regulation SK to simplify and modernize disclosures, and in March of this year, the SEC formally voted to adopt these amendments. These changes are generally designed to improve readability for investors and reduce duplicative and immaterial disclosures. The changes we're going to discuss today impact almost every filer, domestic registrants, foreign private issuers, companies registered under the Investment Company Act, and investment advisors. I want to note that I'm going to focus my discussion today on the changes that primarily impact public U.S. companies in their periodic reporting and securities offering filings, but in many instances, corresponding changes have been made to rules concerning filings made by foreign private issuers and companies that file Investment Company Act reports. If you have any questions about how these rule changes impact other filers, please feel free to submit a question through the Q&A portal. The effective date for almost all of these rules was uh, May 2, 2019, but the confidential treatment changes went into effect April 2, 2019. In addition, there were some changes that implicate the inline XBRL rule changes, and those have the same, same staggered phase-in dates as other IXBRL rules. The most significant changes to Regulation SK that I'm going to discuss today are changes to the management, discussion, and analysis of financial condition and results of operations, changes impacting how registrants can redact confidential information from material contracts filed as exhibits, other changes regarding item 601 and exhibits to SEC filings, changes to disclosures related to property, securities, executive officers, and Section 16A compliance, changes that primarily impact securities offerings documents, and changes related to how registrants can incorporate by reference or cross-reference in security filings. One change that registrants will want to have on their radar for upcoming 10Ks in particular uh, was the amendment that affects how registrants make disclosures in the MD&A section of their reports. Prior to these amendments, 
Item 303A stated that in the MDNA, the discussion and analysis should be of the financial statements and other statistical data that the registrant believes will enhance a reader's understanding of its financial condition, changes in financial condition, and results of operation. Instruction 1 to item 303A also provides that, generally, discussion should cover the three-year period covered by the financial statements and use either year-to-year -year comparisons or any other format that, in the registrant's judgment, would enhance a reader's understanding. Under the new amendment to item 303, registrants are no longer required to use year-to-year -year comparisons in their discussions, but may instead use any presentation that enhances a reader's understanding of the MDNA. In addition, registrants are no longer required to discuss the earliest of the three-year uh, look-back period, the earliest year of the three-year look-back period, if the registrant is providing financial statements covering the past three years. The registrant included the required discussion in a filing, typically a 10K, filed on EDGAR, and the registrant identifies the location of the discussion of the earliest year's financial results. This change was designed to eliminate duplicative disclosures and reduce potentially stale information that isn't particularly useful to investors. The SEC also made some significant changes to how registrants can omit confidential information from material contracts filed as exhibits to Securities Act and Exchange Act filings. Prior to this amendment, a registrant could redact confidential information only after submitting a confidential treatment request, or CTR, to the staff, which is a fairly onerous undertaking. As part of the FAST Act changes, registrants may now redact information uh, without first submitting a CTR. Instead, with these changes to uh, item 601B10 of Regulation SK, registrants can omit or redact information from material contract exhibits, provided that the redacted information is both, one, not material, and two, would likely cause competitive harm if disclosed by the registrant. It should be noted that the staff thought this change important enough that it went into effect a full month prior to all of the other FAST Act changes. Registrants who want to omit, co omit confidential information in material contract exhibits need to make sure that they note in the exhibit index uh, the, that portions of exhibits have been omitted. An example of such language is in italics at the bottom of the screen. In addition, on the first page of any exhibit that has redactions, there needs to be a prominent statement that information was omitted because it is not material and would be competitively harmful if publicly disclosed. Omitted information should be noted in brackets in the exhibit. The SEC staff has also set up separate procedures for how it will review a registrant's determination that information can be redacted from its exhibits, which procedure is designed to protect against inadvertent public disclosure of competitive information. The general compliance review process will be the SEC staff sending a registrant a letter to request paper copies of unredacted exhibits that are marked to show what was omitted from the original filing. Following this, the staff may send a follow-up request for further explanation and substantiation by the registrant of how it concluded that the redacted information was not material or would be competitively harmful if disclosed. When the review has been completed, the staff will send a letter to the registrant advising them of the conclusion of the review. Any comments from the staff will be provided in comment letters, separate from any other comment letters sent by the staff as part of a regular review. With respect to Securities Act filings, the staff has said that registrants must resolve any questions about confidential information prior to submitting a request to accelerate the effectiveness of a registration statement. Once the review is complete, the SEC staff will file on Edgar the initial request for unredacted copies of exhibits and the letter noting the conclusion of the review. SEC staff comments about redacted exhibits will not be made public, nor will any responses from registrants. Similarly, with respect to Exchange Act reports, the SEC will only make public its initial letter and letter noting the completion of the review on EDGAR. If the, if the staff is also conducting a regular review of the registrant's filings, these letters will all be posted at the same time as the rest of the correspondence related to the review, but neither the specific staff comments nor the registrant's responses will be made public. In addition to the rules regarding redacted information and material contract exhibits, the staff has also set up procedures for handling supplemental materials submitted in connection with a review of confidential information. In order to minimize inadvertent disclosures, the SEC cautions registrants to follow the guidance in Rules 418 and or 12B4 rather than submitting supplemental materials directly to the staff member reviewing their confidential information redactions. 
Another change that affects material contracts concerns what agreements need to be filed as material contracts under item 601B10 of Regulation SK. Previously, registrants needed to file as material contracts those agreements not entered into in the ordinary course of business that were one to be performed in whole or in part after the filing of the registration statement or periodic report to which they were filed as exhibits, or two, were entered into not more than two years prior to this filing. The SEC has revised this two-year look-back requirement to only apply to newly reporting registrants. I've included the full definition of newly reporting registrant on this slide, but it picks up registrants who are filing registration statements and who are not subject to the Exchange Act's reporting requirements or public shell companies that are completing a reverse merger to acquire an operating business. Staying on the topic of material contracts, the SEC also amended the instances when a registrant could omit schedules or appendices to material agreements filed as exhibits. Previously, these schedules to agreements could only be omitted if they were attached to exhibits filed under item 601B2, which concerned plans of acquisitions. Now, under the changes adopted by the SEC, schedules can be omitted from any exhibit, provided that they do not contain information material to an investment decision and the omitted information is not otherwise disclosed in the exhibit or disclosure document. Registrants omitting such schedules should include a list on each exhibit, identifying omitted schedules, and provide any omitted schedules to the SEC upon request. In addition, the staff has also codified their prior practice of not objecting to registrants who redact personally identifiable information, like bank account numbers, social security numbers, or addresses from exhibits. Registrants are not required to provide an analysis supporting these redactions at the time of filing. The next few amendments I'm going to touch on all get picked up in 10-Ks. For instance, the staff has amended the requirements in the property description governed by Item 102 of Regulation SK. The staff explained that, although the existing rules advise registrants to only describe materially important properties, many registrants were not heeding this advice and were providing unnecessary or immaterial information. To attempt to remedy this, the staff revised item 102 to make clear that physical properties only need to be disclosed to the extent they are material to the registrant. In addition, there is a more uniform disclosure requirement for registrants that is based on the concept of materiality. Registrants are also allowed to describe their properties on a collective basis. The SEC staff has also revised the disclosure requirement related to the description of a registrant's securities that is found in item 202 of Regulation SK. Previously, registrants were required to file a description of securities with registration statements, but not with their 10-Ks. The uh, staff amended item 202 to require this description to be filed as an exhibit to a registrant's 10-K. The genesis of this change is the idea that investors should not have to review multiple documents, often filed years apart, to understand their rights under securities. Registrants are allowed to incorporate by reference their description of securities, provided that the description on file on Edgar has not changed since the date of filing and provided that the registrant includes a hyperlink to the incorporated material. Another change implemented by the FAST Act rules concerns biographical information about the executive officers, which is required under Item 401 of Regulation SK. Item 401 information is part of the Part 3 information in a 10-K that can be incorporated by reference to a proxy statement. Alternatively, this information can be uh, provided in Part 1 of the Form 10-K and omitted from a registrant's proxy statement. The SEC's recent amendment made clear that any information provided in response to item 401 can be uh, relating to an executive officer can be omitted from the proxy statement. In addition, the heading under which the 401 information is to be provided uh, was re revised to reflect a more plain English approach to filing. It should be noted that this exception only applies to information about executive officers in item 401 and does not cover information about executive officers provided under other sections of the 10-K. The SEC staff has also amended item 405, which requires the disclosure of a registrant's compliance with section 16A of the Exchange Act. The amendments themselves are relatively technical. Reporting persons are no longer required to furnish registrants with copies of their section 16 reports. Registrants are permitted to rely solely on Edgar filings for determining if any section 16 filings were delinquent. The SEC retitled the heading where Section 16 reporting compliance is disclosed, and the staff removed the checkbox on Form 10-K covers that noted any delinquent S uh, Section 16 filings. 
The next set of amendments I'm going to discuss primarily impact prospectuses. For example, item 501B4 previously required that registrants only disclose on the cover of prospectuses the name of, national, uh, the name of a national securities exchange on which their securities are traded. One amendment to this item augments this requirement by noting that if securities are being offered not are not listed on a national securities exchange, the registrant must disclose the principal U.S. market where the registrant has actively sought quotation for the securities. This rule is also amended to require that registrants disclose the market for their securities and trading symbols on the cover of current reports, quarterly reports, and annual reports. Staying on the topic of the cover pages of prospectuses, Item 501B3 was amended to provide guidance on how registrants should describe the price of its securities where it is not practical to provide a price. The amendment approved by the SEC allows registrants to state, the offering, state that the offering price of securities will be determined by a particular method or formula that is described in the prospectus, so long as the registrants provide a cross-reference to this disclosure in the prospectus, which reference should be highlighted. Also on the cover, the subject to completion legend required by item 501B10 was amended slightly by the new Regulation SK amendments. This legend has been mostly unchanged since 1958, even though a federal statute, the National Securities Market Improvement Act, allowed for the preemption of state blue sky laws. To update the subject to completion legend, item 501B10 was amended to allow issuers to remove certain language from the legend when an offering is not prohibited by state law. The risk factor disclosure was relocated from subpart 500 of Regulation SK to subpart 100, which concerns business information. The risk factor disclosure requirement was also amended to remove specifically enumerated examples of material risks, which the SEC staff noted was inconsistent with its principles-based approach to disclosures. The SEC also defined sub-underwriter, which impacts disclosures regarding a plan of distribution, and they also removed several undertakings from item 512, which it felt were no longer necessary. The SEC's rules also impact how registrants can incorporate information by reference in their filings. For example, registrants are no longer permitted to incorporate information by reference into financial statements and notes thereto, except where such information except for where such incorporation is specifically permitted by the SEC's rules. U.S. GAAP, or IFRS. Rule 10D was amended to allow companies to incorporate by reference documents filed more than five years ago. Finally, in connection with the inline XBRL rules that the SEC has been promulgating, registrants will now be required to tag the cover pages of annual, quarterly, and current reports in IXBRL. There's a gradual phase-in schedule for registrants based on what type of filer they are, so this requirement currently only applies to large accelerated filers. In conclusion, I hope this presentation has highlighted for you the many ways, big and small, that the SEC staff has been working to modernize and simplify disclosure. The goal of this endeavor has been to provide investors important information while streamlining processes and reducing owner's requirements for public companies. Going forward, this is a good time to update internal checklists for annual reporting and for prospectuses. Given that the SEC staff in August 2019 proposed changes to modernize the description of business, item 101, legal proceedings, item 103, and risk factor disclosures, item 105, it is clear that these changes to Regulation SK will continue and may even accelerate. Lastly, all filers, but large accelerated filers in particular, need to make sure that they are aware of their IXBRL responsibilities. Great. Thank you, Daniel. Our next presenter is Barlow Mann. Barlow is an associate in the, cap, in the Securities and Capital Markets Group located in our Charlotte office. His experience includes representing public and private companies in securities transactions and other general corporate matters. He will provide an overview on LIBOR, software, and related transition issues. Barlow? Thank you very much. To start off, I will um, give just a, a quick overview on the background of the LIBOR transition and then jump into the substance here. Um, so <clears throat> the London Interbank offered rate, offered rate, or LIBOR, is likely to be discontinued after 2021, posing some important questions. What is happening? What are regulators saying? 
how will this affect my company's existing LIBOR-based contracts, such as floating rate notes or preferred stock? How will this affect my company's SEC reporting obligations? What will replace LIBOR, and how should my company approach its future contracts that have a floating rate component? Adding urgency to this, on July 12, 2019, the SEC Divisions of Corporate Finance, Investment Management, Trading and Markets, and the Office of Chief Accountant published a joint statement encouraging market participants to proactively manage their transition away from LIBOR, which I'll call the SEC Statement. In this presentation, I'm going to touch on all of these topics as well as the SEC Statement. So, what is happening? LIBOR is an indicative measure of the average interest rate at which major global banks could borrow money from one another. It is quoted in multiple currencies and uh, on multiple time frames using data reported by private sector banks. For many, many years, LIBOR has been um, the standard base rate used by companies when they borrow money uh, using a floating rate. The UK Financial Conduct Authority, which regulates LIBOR, has announced that it will no longer persuade or require banks to submit rates for LIBOR after 2021. In light of this, it's expected that a number of private, private sector banks currently reporting information used to set LIBOR will stop doing so after 2021 when their current reporting commitment ends. This could either cause LIBOR to stop publication immediately or cause LIBOR's regulator to determine that its quality has degraded to the degree that it is no longer representative of its underlying market. Sorry, I'm just letting the slides catch up. So, what are regulators saying? On the screen now, you have some uh, a number of quotes uh, from regulators like the SEC and the Federal Reserve, or officials of those entities. Uh, the overall message from regulators is that companies should start acting now to analyze and address or mitigate their LIBOR risk. One, uh, one quotation just yesterday from uh, John C. Williams, the President and Chief Executive Officer of the New York Fed, which hasn't been included on this slide, sums up the regulator's attitude pretty well. If your firm is one of those hoping that the problem will go away or feeling nostalgic and counting on an extension to the deadline, take this message back. The clock is ticking. LIBOR's days are numbered, and we all need to plan our part in preparing the industry for January 1, 2022. Now I'll talk a little bit about uh, the impact on existing contracts referencing LIBOR. Because there's a substantial li uh, likelihood that LIBOR will discontinue after 2021, a company's existing contracts that extend beyond that date and have payment terms that are linked to LIBOR may create legal risk. Many legacy contracts have interest rate provisions referencing LIBOR that, when they were drafted, did not set forth terms governing a situation where LIBOR is permanently discontinued. As a result, there may be uncertainty or disagreement over how the contract should be interpreted. In addition, although some contracts may clearly state what should happen if LIBOR is not available, the mechanism provided may be inconsistent with the, expe with the expectations of affected parties. This is often the case where parties included a contractual provision, assuming that the provision would be used only if LIBOR were temporarily unavailable, not in a context where LIBOR has been permanently discontinued. For example, many floating rate notes that have been issued by companies provide that if LIBOR is not available when interest is supposed to reset, the same value for LIBOR will apply in the next interest period. This type of provision might work well where in a situation where t LIBOR is temporarily unavailable, but if LIBOR is discontinued permanently, that will have the effect of converting a floating rate note into a fixed rate, a fixed rate note, which is hardly what parties expected when they entered into the contract. The SEC staff has encouraged market participants who have not already done so to begin the process of identifying existing contracts that extend past 2021 to determine their exposure um, to LIBOR. For an SEC reporting company, if the company's contractual LIBOR exposure is material, then the company is likely to have disclosure obligations under the SEC's rules. In the SEC statement, the SEC staff notes that a number of existing rules or regulations may require disclosure related to the expected discontinuation of LIBOR, including those related to risk factors. 
Item 105 of Regulation SK and Item 3D of Form 20F require companies to disclose the most important, most significant factors that make an investment in the company speculative or risky, and in making those disclosures to avoid boilerplate disclosure and instead provide disclosures that are tailored to the company's facts and circumstances. How might a company's uh, plans and efforts to transition away from LIBOR affect its underlying results or financial condition in the near future? Management's discussion and analysis. Item 303 of Regulation SK and Item 5 of Form 20F require companies to identify, among other items, known trends or known demands, commitments, events, or uncertainties that will result or that are reasonably likely to result in a material increase or decrease in liquidity, and to describe any known trends or uncertainties that have had or that a company reasonably expects may have a material favorable or unfavorable <laughs> impact on income. Again, uh, a company's uh, plans and potential uh, mitigation efforts for LIBOR may need to be discussed in this context. Board risk oversight. Item 407H of Regulation SK requires companies to disclose the extent of the board's role in risk oversight of the company, such as how the board administers its oversight function and the effect this has on the board's leadership structure. And finally, financial statements. In the, re in the release, the SEC Office uh, of Chief Accountant states that risks related to the expected discontinuation of LIBOR and mitigation, mitigating actions taken in response may have broad impact on a company's financial statements. According to the Chief Accountant, these issues could span a number of different areas, including, for example, the accounting and financial reporting for modifications of terms within debt instruments, hedging activities, inputs used in valuation models, and potential income tax consequences. In particular, the staff of the Division of Corporation Finance also notes that companies should consider disclosing <coughs> the status of company efforts to date and the significant matters yet to be addressed. This, in general, would be qualitative disclosure, explaining what your company has been doing to prepare for the transition and what remains to be done. When a company has identified uh, or companies should also consider disclosing when they have identified a material exposure to LIBOR but do not yet know or cannot yet reasonably estimate the estimated impact. And finally, companies should consider uh, sharing information used by management and the board in, assisting, in assessing and monitoring how transitioning from LIBOR to a, an alternative reference rate may affect the company. Now I'm going to shift gears a little bit and discuss some considerations in connection with new floating rate notes and preferred stock with a floating rate. Market participants should consider whether new floating rate notes or preferred stock that they issue should include more effective LIBOR fallback provisions, or whether those instruments should reference a different base rate entirely. Fallback provisions are contractual terms addressing how interest rates should be determined if LIBOR is not available or is discontinued. In the U.S., the Alternative Reference Rate Committee, a group convened by the uh, Federal Reserve Board, uh, has identified the secured overnight financing rate as its preferred uh, alternative rate for U.S. dollar LIBOR. I'll discuss SOFR a bit, in a bit more detail in a moment. The ARC has also published recommended fallback language for new issuances of floating rate notes, um, as well as other products such as syndicated loans, bilateral business loans, and securitizations. In general, these fallback provisions are, tri are triggered by a clearly discernible external event such as a public sta statement by the administrator of LIBOR that the administrator has ceased or will cease to provide LIBOR. Once a triggering event occurs, the fallback provisions provide for a waterfall of five alternative rates that may apply in place of LIBOR. The first alternative rate that can be determined going down the list then replaces LIBOR. The first alternative rate in the waterfall is term SOFRA, followed by compounded SOFRA. I will discuss these rates in more detail later on. The next uh, three alternatives are, include the alternative rate selected by the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve, and this is in a context where term SOFR and, com and compounded SOFR are not available, followed by the fallback rate that is included in ISDA standard definition for the then applicable fallback, and if all else fails, the rate selected by the issuer or its designee after giving due consideration to any industry accepted rate of interest as a replacement for the then current benchmark. The ARC fallback provisions also provide for an adjustment or spread to be added to the alternative rate selected in accordance with the provisions in order to make the new rate more comparable to LIBOR. This spread will be recommended by the Federal Reserve, but it has not been determined yet. 
Finally, ARC's fallback provisions provide that, in connection with implementing the new alternative rate, the issuer of the, secu the securities will have the right to make certain changes to the terms of the notes, as may be appropriate to reflect the adoption of such alternative rate in a manner that's consistent with accepted market practice. When issuers are uh, drafting disclosure relating to the terms of the notes, they should consider um, carefully the risk factors or other language uh, when they're describing uh, the rights that the issuers have to make these changes, um, as well as the potential for the fact that um, the initial base rate for the notes may be replaced by a benchmark replacement if the initial base rate is discontinued. Um, <clears throat> So, so far in the market, we've seen a number of issuers continue to use LIBOR, um, often including the ARC recommended fallbacks in their notes. Uh, however, we've also seen SOFR making headway. Uh, in recent months, a number of issuers have issued floating rate notes and preferred stock that uh, are linked both to term SOFR and compounded SOFR. Switching gears now to talk about so far, the ARC's preferred replacement for LIBOR. Uh, SOFR is administered by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, and it's a broad measure of the cost of borrowing cash overnight collateralized by Treasury securities, that is, Treasury repo transactions. SOFR is a secured rate, and it does not incorporate any element of bank credit risk, unlike U.S. dollar LIBOR. SOFR is an overnight rate, whereas U.S. dollar LIBOR is a forward-looking term rate that represents interbank funding for a specified term. So, how can SOFR be used as a benchmark for issuances of floating rate notes? There are three main options we have seen used in the market. Term SOFR, compounded average of overnight SOFR calculated in arrears, and a simple average of overnight SOFR calculated in arrears. I will discuss each one of these options at a high level. Currently, no forward-looking term SOFR rate exists. The ARC has set a goal of seeing forward-looking term SOFR rates based on SOFR futures and swaps produced, but these rates may not become available until 2021, close to when LIBOR is expected to cease. Given the potential delay before term SOFR becomes available, the ARC has emphasized that market participants should not wait for the term rate to arrive before adopting SOFR. Even though term SOFR does not, exist, not yet exist, however, some issuers are, have already begun issuing fixed to floating rate notes and preferred stock linked to term SOFR. The interest or dividend rate on these instruments is fixed until some future date, often five or more years in the future, at which point the rate becomes a floating rate. Issuers of these instruments appear to be assuming that term SOFR will likely become available before the floating rate period begins. The rate fallback provisions for these instruments mirror the ARC's recommended fallback provisions for U.S. dollar LIBOR instruments, with the rate waterfall adjusted to reflect the fact that term SOFR is the initial stated base rate, rather than the first fallback option to U.S. dollar LIBOR. Thus, even if term SOFR has not become available by the time the floating rate period begins for these instruments, issuers and holders of the instruments will be in essentially the same position as they would be if the initial interest rate had been U.S. dollar LIBOR using the ARC's recommended fallback provisions. Since many details of term SOFR are not known, for example, who the administrator will be that publishes term SOFR and its publication schedule, the terms of these securities provide that the issuer will have the right to implement a number of changes to the terms of the notes once details relating to an officially endorsed term SOFR become available. For example, issuers may be able to change the definitions of interest period, interest reset period, and interest reset dates, as well as the timing and frequency of determining term SOFR under the notes. When using term SOFR, issuers should carefully consider their disclosures, including risk factors relating to the fact that term SOFR doesn't exist yet and that the issuer has the right to make these changes to the terms of the notes, among other issues. And all of the issuers that we've seen in the market using term SOFR have included risk factors along these lines. The other way to use SOFR uh, is to use an averaged uh, an average of the overnight rates. As an overnight rate, SOFR can be somewhat volatile. So in order to address this, the market, part market participants generally use an average of daily overnight rates over the course of the relevant interest period in order to smooth out potential volatility. The terms of preferred stock and notes with payments based on such an average SOFR rate generally have provided that the average is calculated in arrears at or near the end of the interest period. This means that the average rate will reflect what actually happens to SOFR over the interest period, 
On the other hand, this practice provides very little notice before the payment is due. In general, we have seen two conventions for determining this average of daily overnight rates adopted in the marketplace. The first is simple interest. Under this approach, the additional amount of interest owed for each day in an interest period is calculated by applying, applying the daily rate of interest to the principal borrowed, and the payment due at the end of the period is the sum of those amounts. The second convention is compounded interest. This approach recognizes that the issuer of floating rate notes does not pay back interest owed on a daily basis, and it therefore keeps track of the accumulated interest owed but not yet paid. The additional amount of interest owed each day is calculated by applying the daily rate of interest both to the principal borrowed and the accumulated unpaid interest. The ARC has indicated that the economic difference between these two calculation methods should be expected to be quite small at lower interest rates and over short periods of time, and has published a user's guide to SOFR that includes formulas and worked examples for each type of calculation. When SOFR rate uh, when SOFR notes were first, first issued, issue, issuers generally tended to use a simple interest convention, but the compounded interest convention has gained traction in the marketplace over the last several months, with a number of companies issuing preferred stocker notes using compound, the compounded interest convention. Based on market commentary, some issuers, investors, and other market participants prefer to use simple interest because their IT systems are already set up to accommodate this type of calculation. On the other hand, the compounded interest convention more accurately reflects the time value of money, which becomes more important as interest rates rise. In addition, the ISDA definition of SOFR uses the compounded interest convention, meaning that this convention may allow for more accurate hedging. As I mentioned before, calculating the average SOFR rate in arrears means that there's very little time to calculate interest before payment is due. There have been a number of conventions designed to allow for longer notice of payment within the, uh, within the in arrears calculation framework. <clears throat> the most common uh, of these uh, interest calculation mechanics are a payment delay or a lockout or a look back. The slide on your screen now provides a summary of the way that these three conventions work. The first, line, uh, the first line of the table, plain in arrears, demonstrates the problem. SOFR for any, the overnight SOFR rate for any given day is not published until the next day. This means that unless additional terms of the notes are added, the rate for the final day in the interest period will not become available until the final interest period. The red lines track uh, the relationship between the SOFR rate and the publication date for SOFR demonstrating the problem. With a payment de delay convention, which is the second line in the table, payment for a particular interest period is simply delayed some number of days until after the end of the interest period. Often, two, we've seen uh, two days used in the market fairly commonly. This allows the rates, the SOFR rates used in the calculation to reflect exactly the SOFR rates during the interest period and it gives issuers plenty of time to calculate interest. On the other hand, investors have to wait to receive their payments. The third line of the table demonstrates how a lockout convention is used. A lockout convention provides that a certain number of days before the end of the interest period, the overnight rate for this specified date will apply for the remaining days in the interest period. This provides issuers plenty of time to calculate interest and allows them to pay interest on the final day of the interest period. However, it has the disadvantage of uh, meaning that the overnight SOFR rates used in calculating the interest rate for that interest period are not the exact same as the rates <coughs> that actually emerge in the market during that interest period. The final convention is a look-back convention. Under the look-back convention, the overnight SOFR rates used to calculate average SOFR are lagged several days uh, throughout the interest period. Um, this means that more overnight SOFR rates, more actual overnight SOFR rates are used to calculate interest for each interest period. However, it still doesn't align the overnight rates uh, exactly with the interest with the days included in each interest period. Finally, I'm going to touch briefly on some recent headlines um, around SOFR. SOFR has landed in recent headlines as a result of volatility in the overnight rate. Market participants have noted that overnight SOFR tends to increase 
sometimes sharply, at month end or quarter end. Most recently, on September 17th, a dramatic rate increase in overnight repo markets, the markets underlying the Federal Reserve Bank of New York's calculation of SOFR, caused overnight cipher to spike to 5.25%, setting a record. It has since returned to more normal levels. The Wall Street Journal reported that this volatility has led a number of market participants to express doubts about SOFR suitability as a replacement for LIBOR. The ARC responded to these criticisms by pointing out that average SOFR rates have remained quite smooth, even taking into account recent volatility. While acknowledging that SOFR and other, night, uh, and other overnight repo rates are inherently more volatile than rates such as SOFR that are published on a daily basis. The charts uh, on this last slide that you see demonstrate the, point, the ARC's point that although overnight SOFR tends, can tend to be volatile, um, the averaged rates um, based on overnight SOFR do tend to be smoother over time. So to summarize, uh, I would say the, the market for um, LIBOR transition provisions and SOFR provisions continues to develop day to day. Recent events continue to uh, influence uh, the way market participants think about SOFR as a replacement rate for LIBOR, and we will continue to monitor uh, these developments uh, as they arise. Thank you very much. That was great. Thank you so much. Um, presenting next is John Hoke. John is also a Securities and Capital Markets Associate in our Charlotte office. He focuses his practice on private equity, venture capital, mergers and acquisitions, energy, public company governance, and debt and equity raises, and a variety of other corporate and transactional matters. He will provide best practices when preparing for M&A due diligence. John? Thank you, Jill. <clears throat> um, for those of you on the phone who are, are seasoned M&A pros, you might know a, a lot of what we're going to talk about today. But um, for those of you who aren't, we thought it would be helpful to give you just a primer on the, the M&A due diligence process, uh, particularly in light of, of the recent uptick in M&A activity that we've seen um, in the past two years as a result of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. So I'm going to hit on four big topics today. First is going to be just sort of general logistical and structuring considerations. Um, things like manpower, bandwidth, data rooms. Um, then I'll talk about new areas of, of increased diligence focus that, that weren't really areas of concern five or ten years ago that, that now are hot topics in the M&A world. Um, then I'll cover a few of the sort of key traditional areas of M&A due diligence. And then finally, I'll talk about considerations that are unique to public companies. So when you're preparing for an M&A deal, um, particularly on the sell side, one of the things you want to think about is the size of your deal team. Um, often this is, is driven by confidentiality concerns. Um, I, I recently worked on a transaction where our client carved out about half of its business, and the, the deal team consisted of the CFO and the CEO. That, that was a bad three months for the CFO. Um, I think concerns about size of the deal team have become particularly acute in this tight labor market um, when you're dealing with blue-collar workers who, who feel um, and, and have the, the leverage and ability to walk across the street and get, get the same job at a different employer. So we've seen a renewed focus on really thinking about who within the company on the sell side especially is, is really going to be involved in the transaction. <clears throat> um, and then you want to think about do you have the expertise that you need in-house to handle the deal? Are you going to need to hire um, outside environmental consultants, IT consultants, uh, benefit specialists? Um, and, and this is really a, a key consideration for, for buyers and sellers. Uh, a sort of logistical consideration, if you're selling your business, you want to think, you know, do you have an investment banker involved? They, they can help a lot with a lot of the groundwork that you need to, or legwork you need to do to, to get you know, a data room populated, to solicit bids, um, and, and to really get your company in, in good shape um, so that when you open up you know, your data room or you begin soliciting bidders, um, things look attractive to your prospective buyers. Um, and then think about, do you have the manpower, frankly, just to, 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 to do this? Do you have enough people that can help you scan 400 contracts and get them in a data room. We, we often see this, this task falling to the CFO secretary, and, and by the end of week two, she wants to quit her job. 
Um, so really begin to think about who, who, who is your team? Do you have the bandwidth in-house? Do you need to bring in outside support? Um, on the buy side, you want to begin to populate and prepare a, a due diligence checklist. Many of you probably have seen this before, but they're often quite voluminous. Um, they cover everything from employee benefits to environmental concerns to labor and employment issues, um, litigation history, debt, um, the list goes on and on and on. So you, you want to, if, if you're about to enter a, a transaction, think about preparing that diligence checklist. And also think about who your subject matter experts are going to be, both in-house um, and externally. You're obviously going to hire a legal counsel to help you with that. Um, you may want to hire a, an accounting firm to help with financial diligence. Um, you may want to hire IT consultants um, and environmental specialists. One thing to begin preparing, especially if you are on the sell side, is making sure you have um, good books and records. We, we see this issue a lot with closely held companies and family-owned businesses, particularly with respect to the company's capitalization. If you're doing an equity deal, um, the, the, one of the most intense areas of diligence focus is, is making sure the capitalization of the company uh, lines up with what your buyer expects. So you'll want to make sure you've got a, a well-maintained equity ledger that reflects the current capitalization of the company. Um, your buyer will probably want to see evidence of issuance and cancellation of any equity awards. Um, you should begin preparing a, a schedule for any equity grants that vest over a period of time, particularly if they vest post-closing. Um, in equity deals, capitalization and diligence issues often lead to special indemnities if, if your buyer is not comfortable. So this is really one area, if you're looking to sell your company, you want to, to make sure you hone in on and, and really tidy up before you... Um, before you go out and market yourself. Another thing to keep in mind when thinking about the, the level of diligence is, is obviously deal structure. If you're, if you're doing an asset deal, your, um, your, your contracts are going to be reviewed more closely for change of control and consent issues. If you're doing um, a, a, an equity deal, there's less of a concern about um, uh, anti-assignment provisions being triggered because of the, the transaction. And also, the scope of diligence will be dictated in part by the, the size of the investment. If you're doing a full buyout, you're obviously going to want to turn over every stone and really get to know your company. But if you're doing a, a minority equity investment, um, more like a VC-type deal, uh, your, your diligence focus um, might be less in the weeds and really be more, more about what's the general health of the target as opposed to what's every potential issue that, that we could face as the ultimate owner of this company. You should begin reviewing the, the company's debt structure as well. Um, all your buyers are going to run lien and fixture filing and judgment searches to know what debt's out there. Um, you should have a plan for how to deal with the debt. Will it be paid off at closing? Is it going to be permitted indebtedness that sticks around after closing? Um, and if, if the latter, you want to be particularly mindful of what consents you're going to need. Sometimes getting consents from lenders can be a long, long process. Um, and if you're trying to do a deal with a 30-day close and you've got a holdout lender, that can really gum things up. So um, on, on the sell side, be really mindful of, of, of what your debt structure is and, and what you think will be sticking around post-closing and what you need to do to make sure that doesn't hold up closing. Another point which isn't really a diligence issue but is, is more of a gating item when you're doing an M&A deal is knowing whether your transaction is going to be subject to Hart Scott Rodino compliance. Uh, the current threshold for deals subject to HSR is $90 million for 2019. Um, that threshold adjusts upwards annually. Um, and if your, your deal is above that size, you, both the buyer and the seller have to submit an information statement to the Department of Justice um, detailing the material terms of the transaction. Um, <clears throat> and the review by the DOJ generally takes about 30 days. Either party can request early termination of, of the review period, and if that's granted, then you can close the transaction. But the issue that arises with, with HSR early termination is that the parties that have submitted that HSR request um, are then published in the Federal Register, I, I think it's the next day, so any confidentiality you had about the transaction um, is, is immediately blown. A lot of companies are, are pretty comfortable with this, especially if they're pretty far along in the, in the process, but that's just one consideration to keep in mind when you're thinking about timing for your transaction.
Now I'll shift gears a little bit and talk about areas of, of new and heightened focus in the M&A diligence world. Um, probably the most important area that we focus on now, and, or, or, or the area that we dig in most deeply, is really around data privacy and cybersecurity issues. Um, everyone's heard of all the stories from, from Marriott to, um, to Capital One um, and the enormous exposure that, that comes with data privacy breaches, particularly if, if you're a company that holds um, personally identifiable information um, and especially healthcare-related information. So we always counsel buyers to ask for copies of all of the target's data privacy policies um, you really want to understand what kind of PII the target has. You'll want to ask for a history of all, all breaches um, of, of the company's cybersecurity policies, and then a description of any remediation steps that the target's taken. Um, and, and we really encourage um, a lot of our, our, our buyers, particularly those who are buying uh, technology-heavy companies, to engage an IT consultant to do IT diligence and really assess the 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 health and structure of a company's cybersecurity and data privacy policies and procedures. Um, this is of particular concern now with GDPR and uh, and new California state law um, that is incredibly invasive um, and and quite demanding. Um, and and this is one thing that I think a lot of um, law firms, including ours, have have really bulked up on in the past few years because we know how important it is to our clients. Um, and how important it is in the, the M&A space. Another area of new focus is on um, sexual misconduct. Uh, this is obviously in the wake of, of the Me Too movement, but we, we see a lot of buyers focusing very closely on um, any instances of sexual misconduct by the target company um, and really getting a good understanding of of what their target does, uh, what their what their policies are for sexual misconduct or, or prohibiting, I should say, um, and then they want a full a full uh, re report of any kind of sexual misconduct violations by any employee. Um, I've included on this slide a, a sample representation that that we have included in some of our deal documents, and and we've seen similar iterations of um, from our counterparties, um, and and this is really becoming more and more popular um, as, as a way to guard against and, and get a promise from your target about um, the company being mindful of, of sexual misconduct by its employees. Um, and this way, as a buyer, you have some recourse against against your seller if, if three years after the fact something turns up that you weren't aware of in the diligence process. And then finally, um, there's been a rise um, in, in diligence and scrutiny of companies that have any ties to the cannabis and CBD industry. Um, five years ago, this wasn't a concern. Most, most businesses did not provide services to the cannabis and CBD um, industry, but it, it, it is now projected to be a $20 billion legal industry by 2022. And as a result, you see more and more um, companies that previously had no ties to the CBD space providing services. Um, there are companies providing you know, very sophisticated marketing services, data analytics, um, supply chain support, um, you, you name it. Um, and all those services are perfectly legal, but because the regulatory framework is, is so patchwork, both at the federal and state level, um, this has become an area that a lot of companies really hone in on when they're looking at buying, buying, buying a, a, a company. Um, the two main federal concerns are um, a federal tax concern, so companies that, that deal in the CBD business can't claim certain tax credits and deductions. So you want to be aware of if, if your target um, fits into one of the categories that is not exempt from this, that's going to be an issue you'll have to deal with um, post-closing. Um, and then a lot of financial institutions are not allowed to, to transmit money that's related to the marijuana or CBD industry. Um, so if that if that is a, a concern for you as a buyer, you want to be mindful of of um, what your your target's exposure is to that industry. And our recommendation is always if if you as a buyer suspect that your target has any connections to the CBD industry, to to ask more questions and really dig in on that issue to determine the extent of that connection. Now I'll talk about a few just general areas of of. M&A due diligence that we tend to focus on, the, these are not new, but they're important considerations. 
Um, one, we always recommend that buyers take a close look at any kind of environmental liability that their target may have. Um, this obviously varies based upon the type of, of company that your target is. If it's an industrial company that has a lot of heavy manufacturing, um, uses chemicals or petroleum products, this is obviously a bigger concern. If, for example, it's a professional services business or a consulting firm, you have less, less, of, less exposure there and, and less need to really dig in on this. You'll want to ask if there have been any Phase 1 or Phase 2 reports. Um, the seller should disclose this if so. Um, and then really just consider whether or not the type of business um, that you're buying warrants further investigation by an environmental consultant. Uh, maybe this leads to site visits, core sampling, things like that. Uh, employee benefits are obviously another area of important focus if you're, if you're acquiring a company. You want to make sure you know whether or not your target contributes to any um, pension or retirement plans, and if, if they do, to make sure that's done so in accordance with ERISA. Um, you want to be mindful of whether or not the target provides benefits through a PEO or whether it sponsors its own plan. Um, it can sometimes be challenging if you've got a PEO provided benefits package to get those plans rolled over to a buyer. Um, it's not impossible to do, but it often takes more lead time than, um, than you would typically expect. And then you want to be very mindful of whether or not the target's contributed to any multi-employer pension plans. Um, the withdrawal liability for contributions to multi-employer pension plans can be can be significant, um, and your your liability can be greater than the amount that that you or, or your target should have contributed. Um, we we have seen um, a number of instances where um, pension plans have come after um, companies that have fully contributed to a multi-employer plan. Um, but they're coming after those companies for, for deficiencies in the contributions of other participants. Um, and so many of these multi-employer pension plans are severely underfunded. Um, and it, as a result, if you learn that your target's contributed to one of these, you, you'll be very, very mindful of what the exposure there could be. Um, I worked on a transaction recently where uh, our target contributed a very nominal amount to a plan. and um, it, it slowed the deal down significantly, um, even though we had fully funded our, our position um, because of the potential exposure here. So just make sure you're mindful of, of the extent to which, if at all, your targets contributed to one of these plans. IP is obviously also an important area of focus. If you're a data-heavy company, you want to make sure that um, you've got proper IP assignment language or IP assignment provisions and contracts, that you have non-disclosure agreements. Um, and that all your employees and, and consultants have assigned over um, any IP made for your target to the company. Uh, real property is another area of focus. Make sure you review any leases for consent issues. In, in my experience, landlord consents are often the, 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 the most difficult to get. Um, many landlords are often trying to renegotiate the terms of a lease um, you know, in, in connection with an M&A deal, so make sure you get your landlord consents moving early in a transaction. <clears throat> um, you want to look at your material contracts and make sure you review those for any non-compete and non-solicit provisions. Uh, be aware of any extraordinary indemnities in those contracts. Um, and sellers should be proactive about renewing any material contracts that are going to lapse during the deal negotiation process. Now I'll close with just a few considerations that are unique to public companies. Um, in the M&A process. The first being really how much diligence is enough. Um, because so much of a, a public company's history is public, you'll, you'll want to ask, do you need to dig beyond what's, what's published on Edgar um, and what's in the company's periodic report? If you have a big company, um, you know, a, a, you know a, a large market cap company that, that's been reporting for you know, many years, you probably have enough material available um, and on Edgar and in the public domain to, to get comfortable without additional diligence. But if you have a smaller business that's not been reporting for a while, you may want to dig in a bit more um, and, and go beyond what's just available publicly. Uh, you also want to think about what's the materiality threshold for, for what you review in your diligence process. Um, for example, if, if, if I were working on the Charter and Time Warner Cable merger, um, and I were the partner involved, I, I would have said, okay, we're not going to review commercial contracts that involve payment of less than $300,000 a year or something to that effect. 
um, there's just too much to review and too much to triage that you really have to be mindful of, of what, what your materiality threshold is for diligence. Um, same is true for litigation. You know, are you only going to look at litigation and, and claims that have exposure to the company above a million dollars, two million dollars, whatever it may be? But it's important to think about what those thresholds are before you begin the diligence process. Um, the deal structure for uh, public M&A will also influence what you look at. The typical Delaware reverse triangular merger is not going to trip a lot of your anti-assignment clauses and contracts. Um, it will trip change of control clauses, but not anti-assignment. So uh, again, knowing your structure and being aware of what that is will help you um, winnow down the list of what you want to look at. <clears throat> And then finally, you want to be mindful of sharing any kind of competitively sensitive information, particularly if it's two large companies who, who work in the same industry. Um, you, you obviously, you want to be mindful of antitrust concerns throughout the entire process. So think about what you should be doing if you're sharing competitively sensitive information, who gets to see it, will it be redacted, will just the attorney see it, um, because you don't want to have a footfall here or, or, or be in violation of antitrust concerns. Um, through your, your diligence process. And that is all I have. Great. Thank you so much. In closing, everyone, as a reminder, if we did not address your questions during the call today, we will follow up with you shortly by email. Please always feel free to contact us with any additional questions or comments in the interim using the information displayed on your screen. We thank you all for attending today. And please be in touch if you have any further questions. Thank you again. Bye-bye.